Um, I, I want to welcome you to the University of Minnesota and the 15th annual Pancake Poetry event. Uh, to those of you joining us online, welcome to you as well. Thank you all for being here today. I'm Angie Oler, the Associate University Librarian for Collections and Content Strategy at the University of Minnesota. Dean Lisa German is sorry she can't be here. Her daughter had her baby early, so she is in Connecticut. Uh, at the University Libraries, we celebrate National Poetry Month every year by hosting the annual Pancake Poetry event, which honors Marcia Pancake, a retired librarian who loves poetry and sponsored poetry readings while at the libraries. Some of our past presenters include Sun Young Shin, David Mura, Deborah Keenan, Margaret Hasi, Bao Fi, Jim Lenfesti, and many more. Today, I am pleased to introduce you to Dr. Gwen Nell Westerman. Dr. Westerman is the author of Follow the Blackbirds, a poetry collection written in Dakota and English, and co-author of Minnesota, Makochi, the Land of the Dakota, which won a 2013 Minnesota Book Award and a 2014 Hognander Minnesota History Award. Her new poetry collection, Songs Blood Deep is published in English and Dakota. Westerman's recorded poetry is featured in a permanent exhibit, Native Truths, Our Voices, Our Stories, which opened in May 2022 at the Field Museum in Chicago. Dr. Westerman is the recipient of the Douglas R. Moore Faculty Research Award and three artist initiative grants from the Minnesota State Arts Board. She also is the first indigenous poet laureate of Minnesota and the first person of color to be poet laureate. In 2022, Dr. Westerman received an Academy of American Poets Laureate Fellowship she teaches American and Native Nations literature, technical communication, humanities, and creative writing at the university at the Minnesota State University, Mankato. Before we welcome Dr. Westerman to the podium, I would like to acknowledge the peoples upon whose land we meet. The University of Minnesota, Twin Cities, is built within the traditional homelands of the Dakota people. It is important to acknowledge the peoples on whose land we live, learn, and work as we seek to improve and strengthen our relations with tribal nations. We also acknowledge that words are not enough. We must ensure that our institution provides support resources, and programs that increase access to all aspects of higher education for American Indian students, staff, faculty, and community members. Now, please welcome Dr. Gwen Nell Westerman. Oops. My awesome tech provider back there told me that he has put on the tall and thin filter for me. <laughs> thank you so much for that great introduction. And thank you to Marcia Pancake for creating a space for us to sing. Poetry is older than song, which is older than history. And I'm so happy to be here to share, share with you today.
this book was a long time coming, so I have to acknowledge um, um, Holy Cow Press and their patience. And some more patience. And some more patience. But um, neither of my parents spoke English before they were sent to boarding schools when they were five and six years old. My mother in northeastern Oklahoma and my father in South Dakota. Um, so that's how I come to be a citizen of the Cherokee Nation on my mother's side and um, a citizen of the Sistan Wapitan Dakota Oyate on my father's side. They met at Haskell Indian Institute in the 1950s. And um, for a long time, I tried to figure out how I could write something that would bring those oaky roots with this Dakota presence in my life together. And that's what you have in front of you, songs, blood deep. Um, and because it's so important for us to do things that leave a mark for the generations that come after us, we are often instilled with the understanding that we have a responsibility to seven generations after us because somebody seven generations before us was putting good energy and prayers out there that we might be here. So Songs Blood Deep is for our granddaughters, granddaughters, granddaughters. Shout out to Roy Boney Jr., Cherokee artist, Cherokee speaker for the cover art. This is called The um, Magician. How many people have done your Ancestry.com, DNA, 23andMe, Okay. I was kind of scared to do it, but <laughs> in case there are people out there that I didn't really want to know I was related to. <laughs> but uh, my grandma's, my mom's mom is the one who um, raised me pretty much until I was about four years old. So I spent a lot of time with her. So the title and uh, the title poem are directly from her. Songs, Blood Deep. My grandma told me that her grandma told her that her grandma told her that when we came over the top of the world, there were already people here. Beyond seven generations times seven generations, we have carried this history and passed it on to the next generation in our blood and in our songs. I heard my grandma's 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 story again, two years after she left this world. The sustained, the, the sustained symmetry of songs, blood deep in our mitochondrial DNA showed the world what we had always known. We're mitochondrial group C, haplogroup C, the third group to come over the top of the world to this side. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. And my grandma would say, I only went to the eighth grade, I don't know nothing. You know, like, when I got that, it's like, Grandma, you you knew a lot. Yeah. <clears throat> First song. Sitting on a quilt made from her husband's work pants, 
spread out on the ground behind the house he bought for her. On a late autumn afternoon, my grandma taught me to sing. Une, la, la, he, you, we, ji, he, go, go, ya, We you lo say, Ega Guya Hona. Then she told me, It is a sin to be greedy, to hoard when others are needy. Always share something, always. A cup of coffee, some wild mint tea, just a glass of water, a bowl of soup, a few boiled eggs, a piece of bread, a clean towel, some warm socks, a spool of thread, a length of calico, some dried corn, a bit of meat, a wooden spoon, a small pail, a basket, a gentle touch, a prayer, a song. Nothing fancy, just a token that we care for each other in good times and in bad. Share, not give or take, but share whatever you have, no matter how small. To accept a gift is to know how we are related, to understand our need to be connected, to learn how to receive love, even if we think we don't deserve it. She only went to school until the eighth grade. She had a pretty hard life. Uh, bore four children during the depression. Only two of them survived. Um, made her way out west uh, during World War II and worked in the shipyards in San Francisco. And um, in um, another poem, from my, my first book, I talked about that experience, how she married Mr. Wright and found out that he wasn't. Oh. <laughs> um, but then she met the grandpa that I knew, um, and he, he brought her back to Kansas and had a house and had a job, and everything turned out much better for her. So I was the first grandchild those of you who are the first grandchild, you know what that means. <laughs> we are the favorite. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Blood memory. Once in school, they taught us that Navajo mothers buried their babies' umbilical cords beneath the Hogan threshold so they would always know where home is. My mother kept my siblings' cords, black shriveled little twigs, in a small box along with their baby teeth and diaper pins. Once I asked her, where's mine? Oh, she said, I threw it away a long time ago. Perhaps that explains the feeling that I did not belong there. Why I wondered how a different family might be. Why I wandered through books or on my bike alone. 
why I left home at 17 and never really went back, why I migrated north to Kansas City, where once at an art show, I bought a watercolor of a bluff, resplendent with fall colors, wondering how I knew that place that seemed like home. I wandered farther north where the bluffs along the Minnesota River, resplendent with fall colors, were exactly the same as the watercolor I bought years before, and somehow I knew this place. Once I stood across from the bluff along the Minnesota River, offering food and prayers when the soles of my shoes seemed to dissolve. My feet and the ground were joined. Gentle hands reached up, grasped my ankles, and anchored me there. I knew this place where the land claimed me, no longer wondering, no longer wandering. I was home. When I got a job at Mankato State University, I had never heard of Mankato except on Little House on the Prairie, which is where Ma and Pa went when they wanted to get away from those rowdy kids. <laughs> um, so when I told my dad and told my Uncle Floyd, I got a job in Mankato. I was so excited. I'm going to be a university professor. In two separate conversations, one from South Dakota, one from California, the response was the same. You know what they do to Indians there, don't you? And I said, no. We'll see how long you last. I'm in my 30th year. <laughs> Um, I write a lot about the landscape. Nobody likes to ride with me when I drive because I'm like, look over there, look at the trees. <laughs> this morning, look over there, there are two snow geese in the river. Um, yeah, no, nobody likes to ride with me. <laughs> Mom, keep your eyes on the road. Um, but I pay a lot of attention to the land and the seasonal change, uh, the, the birds, migrations, um, just the animals. Uh, we're fortunate to live south of Good Thunder, Minnesota, along the Maple River um, in the middle of agricultural fields, but uh, we back up to River Ravine on two sides. And just to be able to see the animals come and go, to see um, the birds migrate. And I'm the one that runs out of the house yelling when I hear the red-winged blackbirds for the first time in the spring. They're here, they're here, they're here. Um, and so it's a, a perfect place to be distracted by all the beautiful things around us. Ancestral Journey. Along a busy highway in a new mown field, a sandhill crane family, parents with two young, feed in the yellow stubble. On guard, one adult stands tall, watching intently over the land at sunset as the two small ones move along the rolling ground. Unaware of the traffic, they prepare to rest for the long journey ahead, mapped into their cells along this ancient flyway. But I also have to drive into town to go to work. <laughs> Crow knows. Crow glistens iridescent in the late morning sun amid fallen leaves along a busy street 
where dying grass and concrete intersect. Drivers rush, halt, rush, halt. A blur of steel and rubber, their eyes staring straight ahead. Scarlet maple leaf in his beak, crow admires its radiant beauty in the late morning sun. Amid the dying grass and concrete, the blur of steel and rubber and winks. Some of you probably heard this story before, but um, I was working with Nebraska Indian Education one, one year to prepare a summer camp for high school students. And we were trying to think about what kind of snacks we would want to have. And I said, well, I, I think we should have Tonka bars. They're made out of bison and cranberries. Yeah. And so I said, well, where do you get them? So I had to Google it. And um, what I came across first was not Tonka bars, but Tonka poetry. Who knows Tonkas? Extra points in the back row. Okay, who knows haiku? Okay, everybody knows haiku. Yeah. <laughs> English teacher in the front. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, how many lines, how many syllables in haiku? 15. Three lines, 17 syllables. Tonka, five lines, 31 syllables. So I love writing tonkas. It's instant gratification because um, it's compact, but it's more gratifying than just um, haiku. There's just not quite enough time to say what I need to say in space with a haiku, and tonkas are really great. Um, in this in this collection, I had a a prose piece that I had written in, oh, probably five or six years ago. And I knew it needed to say something else, and I couldn't quite figure out what to do with it. And I put it in Tonka form and made a longer poem out of it. And it's like, yes, this is awesome. So a lot of the, the, the work in here is composed of, of Tonkas. October morning. My dog walks with me early this morning to sounds of gravel crunching under our feet on the lane, barred owls calling in the woods. Across the ravine, the sun rising through the trees creates coral clouds that fade to yellow and whites as crickets sing to greet dawn. Dust lays like a fog over the newly cut fields of corn and soybeans. Corn husks ride the breeze like birds as three crows chat on a fence. I teach humanities. My favorite class to teach is Humanities 150, Introduction to Western Civilization from the time we opened our eyes as humans to the Renaissance. 15 weeks. <laughs> Talk about a whirlwind of a class. It's just like, whoa. Um, but it is one of my favorite classes to teach because I can talk about history, I can talk about politics, I can talk about architecture and art um, and poetry and science um, in that span of time in terms of Western civilization. So you'll find references in my work to all of those kinds of things. Um, I even write about astrophysics because Dakota people are star people. So to write about stellar nucleosynthesis is just right up our alley. Mm -hmm. Hey, hey, too, hey? Uh -huh. 
Isn't that right? I said, yep. The impermanence of light. A surprise among the grass after a soft rain, a purple flower appears, its center a star shining in the waning sun. Perhaps Monet was inspired by such simple sights, red leaves floating in the grass, subtle changing shades, the impermanence of light. So this collection is divided by season. That was fall. Next, it's the one year to winter. I'll let you decide about this one. One a day is good for vitamins, apples, horoscopes, sunrises, famous quotes. Just one and only one. Counting minutes, hours, people in lines ahead of or behind us. Insults, perceived or real. Numbering our grudges, ordering our lives. Looking out for number one, hearing second is another word for loser. One way, one right, one and only one just one. What do we lose by counting just one and only one? I'm watching the clock. <laughs> November 16th, a grandma's birthday, 100 years today, already gone 20. When I told you, your sister Liza came and stood at the foot of my bed. You said it was because she was thinking of me when she died. Your sister Katie, too, then, I suppose, when she appeared in the hallway while I was watching TV, she smiled, her lips cabana red, then disappeared. When the phone rang and they told me you were gone, I didn't know what to say. They said your last words were, I don't even feel like I'm alive. There was no visit to me in the space between here and beyond when you left. Who were you thinking of then? Nothing but the truth. Power concedes nothing without a demand. Frederick Douglass. <clears throat> Power concedes even though the majority did not rule. Debunked stories repeated as fact become alternative truth. Nothing without or within can progress beyond fear turning struggle into process, unblurring lines between fact and fiction. Then a demand to be heard, to be recognized, to take active measures, and to recover what truth really means. Storyteller, noun. Definition, one, narrator. Two, liar. Three, informant as in oral history. Also, stool pigeon, sneak, mole, spy. If that is how Mr. Webster defined and described it in these United States of America, it is no wonder our storytellers have no place. 
Our definition, one, culture keeper, two, tradition bearer, three, rememberer, as in oral history. Also, teacher, helper, moral compass, poet. That is how our sources define and describe it in these indigenous homelands, where wonder and story make a place for all of us. Conversion Conversations. Hekta Achana Dana Ayapi. They said, we come to share our love of God. Teach us your language. We gave you our hand in friendship. We gave you our God in love. They said, we come to take the land you gave us in our treaties. We gave you our names in trust. We gave you our word in belief. Then they said, now we will tell your stories in our language. We had nothing left to say. This poem has a very specific number of words in it. It's called Song for the Generations, December 26. We rise together, singing our prayer as one. Hear us. We are here standing at the center, see us. We do this today so our people will live tomorrow. We offer our hands as human beings, remember us. How many words? How many words? 31. 38. December 26th. Huh. Mm. Mm. Lost count of 15. <laughs> it, uh, it, it's okay. That was like a pop quiz. <laughs> now now y'all are going to be like, okay. <laughs> Wet to spring. I worked with the Hmong Charter School um, a number of years ago. And um, when I came for my first class visit, I spoke to them first in Dakota and their eyes got really big. And, I, and then I said who I was and I said, do you have a question? Cause they were all like, and they said, what language was that? And I told them and they said, we thought you were one of us. <laughs> But we went to Fort Snelling State Park uh, in the spring, and I said, okay, now the birds here sing in Dakota. And they're like, oh, no. I said, okay, now listen. Wet to, wet to, what bird is that? And they would hear them all over the place. And I said, they're saying spring. That's the word for spring. Wet to, wet to. I love our state parks. Everybody should love our state parks. I'm especially, well, you're not supposed to pick your favorite child, but my daughter will tell you it's my son. Um, <laughs> but Minneopa State Park has a special place in our hearts because we helped reintroduce the bison herd there and did it in a Dakota way. Uh, we talked about, you know, how to bring them in with ceremony. We brought them in with song and prayer. Uh, when the first group came out of the trailer, 
um, we, we were there and we sang for them, we prayed for them, and then we fed everybody. Uh, we fed the, the semi-truck drivers who brought them. We fed the vets, the reporters, the park people, the state officials, everybody. We did not feed them bison. We fed them some, we've made soup, but not, not bison soup. Um, but um, we have such a treasure in this state with our, our state parks. So I spent a lot of time at Fort Snelling and this is at Fort Snelling State Park. Yesterday, a mouse in a sharp black trap struggled in the pavilion near the visitor center as people walked to the door. It was tired and weak so I gently stroked its back there in the soft grass, sang for it, and set it free. Mitakuye Owasi. A lot of my tonkas, I sometimes write first in Dakota, sometimes in English. So this is Ampetu Techa Hecha. Do wan ota na wahun hechan wekta ka iyo makbi. Ampetu Techa Hecha. Zikara e do wampi. At dawn, I awoke to the sound of bird songs floating on the breeze, the promise of a new day carried in their melody. We a kaska. We a kaska e chaga e wabadake o wayang washte. Chistinak a washtena. We ki e o yak baka. On my morning walk, I see feathers in the ice, sparkling in the sun. Small and beautiful they shine all along the gravel road. The, the poems that are in the Field Museum in Chicago are in three languages, Dakota, English, and Spanish. Uh, so I will read the English one for you. and then you'll have to go hear them at the Field Museum. When I first got the email, they asked me if I would participate in that. I had to Google everybody on the email chain and check it out to make sure that it was real. But we would like to include your poetry in the new Native Nations Hall at the Field Museum in Chicago. And I'm like, yeah, right. <laughs> So this is this is the English version. Strong people. Strong people walked here long before concrete and steel, nourished by the earth. We are the seeds they planted, fed by darkness and light. Hopeful hands work soil in drought and flood, frost and fire, growing together, sharing their harvest with love. Strong people are walking here. And the last one that I will do for you Odowan Tokahea. Retracing the steps of my Dakota ancestors along a route to commemorate their forced march, I sang these words before I knew what they meant. Before I knew the history of the women, the children, the old people, the families in the aftermath of the war, that war. Makasi tomini da kod wicho hanki o terhike ina ate dama kota kepcha 
Mani Hanichi Marking each mile with a prayer stick, speaking the names of the families, singing this song 150 times in seven days for six years. My grandma died before I was born, yet her grandma's grandma's stories imprinted in my cell memory were remembered. So we have time for some questions and I can carry this mic around so everybody can hear and our online audience can too. So if you just want to raise your hand, I'll come to you. If you twitch, I'll call on you. Yeah. I've been a teacher for a long time. Thank you. Um, it's a, it's, those are family stories and they, they they have a rich background and, and they're just reflecting on the, that it shares, it, it shares much with us. About your publisher, how do you, do you contract with, to produce a, a 20 volume, volume or, or a 20 page book in advance? Uh, why, why is a, is a publisher impatient? You write at the speed you write. Well, because I had a deadline and then I had another deadline and then I had another deadline and then it was finally like, okay, I got to, I got to get this done. <laughs> <laughs> so he had the patience of a saint um, to help me get this get this going. Yeah, it it's all on me. <laughs> you know, my grandma said, "Good intentions pave the road to hell." <laughs> I'm thinking about what your uh, your relatives told you when you were moving to Minnesota. That war. And I'm thinking about the good news, because this university, I remember, I audited the first class of George Morrison when he came here, and that was 1970, I think. And I bring it up because this was the first Native American studies in the United States at the University of Minnesota, and we should be proud of that. But it was a long, long battleship that began to turn around. But do you feel it's, uh, uh, how, how, how do you feel at this point in history? You make it sound like I've been here a long time. You said 30 years. <laughs> I didn't make that up. <laughs> this is being recorded, right? <laughs> I think it's sometimes two steps forward, three steps backward. Um, administrations change. Um, sentiments change. Um, I know there are well-intentioned people out there. Remember what my grandma said. Um, our non-native colleagues who want everybody to be angry because this is what happened here and we should be angry about it and we should be demanding change. But that is not what my relatives taught me. We don't do anything in anger because it just begets more anger. So sometimes I feel like it's an uphill three steps and roll down to the bottom. Um, but this semester I'm teaching uh, a, a undergraduate graduate seminar on Native American Lit, and I specifically chose books that were not about bones, feather, feathers, and beads. Um, there's a, a detective novel by Stephen Graham Jones. My cousin on my mom's side, Eddie Chukulate, who writes for the Star Tribune, his memoir, This Indian Kid, Linda Lagarde Grover's Gitchigami Hearts, uh, Louise Erdrich's um, Future Home of the Living God. Native people write science fiction. Eric Gansworth's Apple to the Core that's all about the influence of Beatles music in his life. And two of my students said, you know, I've taken a lot of 
Indigenous Studies classes. And this is the first time there's been joy. <laughs> so I'm feeling a little better this week. <laughs> no, so, so it, it's, you know, that's why I said it's three steps forward, two steps back. And, and it, it'll always be a struggle because there are so few of us. Are there any online questions? No. Any other questions from the audience? See you next. I would like to hear uh, about when you found poetry. And do you, do you have a recollection of writing your first poem, that sort of thing? My first poem was a knockoff of Robert Lowell. Um, and I don't remember which one is mine and which one is his. Like shakes of salt against the sky, snowflakes go passing by. But then, is that mine or is that his? Because the other, the companion piece is like shakes of pepper against the sky, the, the birds are. I should go look it up. But, um, and my teacher told me, that's really good. I didn't tell her that I just, you know, modeled after someone else. Um, then my English teachers told me I was a good writer. You should be a journalist. I'm like, no, I'm going to be a doctor. Um, not this kind. Um, and so I took a lot of science classes. I still love to write. People loved the letters I wrote because I have used to write lots and lots of letters. I hope everybody in this room knows what those are. <laughs> not texts, not emails, handwritten letters. Um, and they uh, told me that I really had a gift for writing. And when I was a senior in college at Oakland State University as a chemistry major and a philosophy minor with lots of electives in English, I took physical chemistry and could not pass it. I hit a roadblock. So I became a technical writer. I got into the technical communication program, and that kind of carried me forward. But there was always a lot of journaling, always a lot of storytelling, always a lot of letter writing. And um, I remember um, I was at a function with uh, Louise and Hyde um, after being at the Turtle Mountain Writers Workshop that they had invited me to. And she introduced me to someone and said, she's a wonderful poet. And this person said, oh, really? Um, and I said, she thinks so. <laughs> so it was a long journey, but yeah, I think it's always been there because I love to sing. I love to tell stories. And as far as I know, since I haven't tried fiction, poetry is much more gratifying. It's like instant gratification as compared to writing up a long novel, even a short novel. <laughs> so I think it's always it's always been there. Okay, we've got another question back here. In addition to writing poetry, you're a fiber artist, right? I was wondering if there's any interplay between your writing and your fiber art. They both tell stories. Um, I depict some traditional stories, some historical stories in my my fiber art. Um, and I think that's that's what where the intersection is between the two. it's It's just two different forms of storytelling. And um, I have a piece right now that's in the Oscar Howe tribute show in Sioux Falls, um, or it's moving to Sioux Falls. Um, that was um, my interpretation and fabric of one of his, his paintings. It's three horses running. And um, they told me, oh, we're gonna hang your quilt so that people can see both sides. And I thought, oh, no. You never look at a quilter's backside, you know? 
or a quilt's backside. Um, <laughs> and so I thought, what am I going to do? So I backed it with star fabric, you know, like galaxy stars. And then I hand stitched the outlines of the three horses with metallic silver threads so that they would be visible on the backside. And on the backside, I put Swarovski crystals, like their constellations. And then I saw the photos of the show and it was hanging on the wall. <laughs> So I got to have a talk with them when it moves to the next venue. <laughs> so to me, it's it's just two, two aspects of, of storytelling. Any other questions? We have time for a couple more. When did you land in Minnesota and when did you begin teaching? At the same time. <laughs> Oh, wait, no, when did I begin teaching? Does teaching 101, composition 101 as a graduate student, does that count? That's true. Okay. Well, that's going to make me sound really old. Um, came to Minnesota in 1991. I came from corporate. I worked in Kansas City for a big uh, financial services firm in the system side of the house doing documentation because I was a technical writer. And because I came from corporate, that's how I think Don's heard this story a hundred times. So is my husband. Um, and so I got here. There's a university here. And so I made an appointment with President Margaret Preska. And I got to her office and she said, how can I help you? I told her who I was, what my background was, what can I do for you? She said, well, let me take you to meet Dean Early. So she took me to Dean Jane Early's office and said, you should talk to Gwen. And Dean Early says, what can I do for you? I said, what can I do for you? <laughs> she took me to the department chair, Terry Flaherty, introduced him to me and I said, here I am, how can I help? And he said, well, would you like to teach technical communication as an adjunct instructor? I said, sure. And then that was my first year. And then there was a tenure track position available. They hired three people that next year and one of them was me and I've been there ever since. Mm -hmm. So yeah, kind of a, it, in academia for sure but but i'm still that way you know it's that's how i was raised corporately who's the decision maker that's where you go it's not academia but it did <laughs> i still yeah. work that way but thank you very much uh, we've got time for one last question yeah okay any other questions one last question Since you are a storyteller and a teacher, have you considered writing anything for children? Yes. Yes. Um, and I have uh, bits and pieces of things. Um, we've also talked about doing things in Dakota language um, as stories for children. Um, so it's it's there. And I'm also helping edit a series for the Minnesota Humanities Center with Hyde Erdrich, um, the Native Lives series. Uh, so we're, I got my, I got my toe in the water. <laughs> <laughs>